Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been fun to see people in the chat, seeing where people are joining from. Uh, if you've just joined, um, please uh, talk to us on the chat. Uh, make sure you do the drop down to everyone and uh, yeah, let us know what uh, problems you're hoping to solve by joining us today. Uh, it's great to see some people who are rejoining us from our session that we did last week, which has an overview of GitOps and Flux. Uh, and yeah, let us know how we can help today, what problems you're looking to solve, uh, and let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, I am joining from San Francisco, and my name is Tamo Nakahara. I'm the VP of Developer Experience here at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we're very thankful that we've got our trusted community manager, Stacy, uh, who organizes these great events. Um, and today, today we've got uh, Priyanka Ravi, uh, aka Pinky, who's one of our developer experience engineers, who will be uh, walking you through the um, processes with Flux of how to get started. So if they are brand new to this series, welcome. Thanks for joining us. If you're brand new to our um, Weaveworks uh, various talks uh, or our various GitOps talks, welcome. Um, Stacy will be posting um, various links, one of which is um, one of our many meetup pages, and that's probably the best place to see the calendar of events for the future. So if this is your first time, then welcome. And if you've come before, then welcome back. And it's great to see everybody. Let's do a quick intro here. Uh, so as I mentioned, we work for a company called Weaveworks. If you haven't heard us before, then uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a couple of products. Um, we have one that's a SaaS product that uh, does GitOps and a um, variety of other things, uh, monitoring. Uh, and then we have a product now called Weave GitOps that has various levels. And um, basically it provides um, GitOps for your various needs. Uh, but much of what we've done is founded on open source, like the SaaS product Weave Cloud that I mentioned in the beginning. It was um, originally based on three of our open source projects called Scope. Uh, Flux that you'll hear a lot about today, um, and Cortex, which is built on Prometheus. Uh, and so uh, also our Weave GitOps products are completely now built on Flux, as you'll uh, see a little bit today. Uh, and that's because Flux is a tool that we created for ourselves for um, continuous delivery. And um, we realized other people really liked it as well and, and um, we're finding a lot of value from it. So it's pretty much been what inspired us to create the term GitOps. Uh, it's been going through the CNCF. We are very, very close to um, reaching graduation. Now that the TOC is finalizing uh, their uh, elections, we'll be submitting our final application for going from incubation to graduation and have gone through security audits and everything already. So I'm very excited about this final stage. Um, some of us, you might, some of you might have heard of us through uh, Flagger, which is um, something that one of our um, developer experience engineers built on Flux, uh, which also extends Kubernetes, and uh, it provides like canary deployments and blue green deployments. So that's become folded within the Flux project. So um, the two together are really like a powerhouse of. Um, GitOps and progressive delivery um, and all in the CNCF with many, many enterprise users. So um, if you are new to all this, hopefully this will help give you a little bit of a, um, you know, an intro uh, and then continue to chat with us via email or Slack or whatever you need, because we want to make sure that you are successful with these projects. Um, and then we've got so much more, uh, many, many more than on this list, um, because this company is very much founded on open source. Uh, I mentioned Cortex, which was created here, which is now in the CNCF. We've got other things like Ignite and EKS Cuddle. Um, and then way in the early days, probably a lot of people know us from WeaveNet, which was one of our first um, open source projects. So if this is your first time hearing about this, um, you know, please reach out and uh, follow up. We're happy to give more information. Um, you can also check out our website, which is weave.works. Um, and uh, we're happy to answer your questions. Uh, OK, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so Pinky and I will be um, presenting. Um, for some of you, like I mentioned, who um, came last week and sort of got the overview of what is GitOps and Flux, I'll give a very concentrated version of that uh, as a good refresher. Um, and then maybe for those of you who are coming new. 
Uh, and then Pinky will go through the steps of getting started with Flux in two ways, uh, one for certain types of users and another for other types of users. Uh, so we hope that both will be uh, useful for you. Uh, and so just depending on how things go with questions and stuff, um, you know, we might take up the full 60 minutes or we might end a little bit earlier. But um, yeah, let us know what your questions are. So speaking of questions, um, we will, I will be monitoring questions in the chat. I see many of you um, mentioning a lot of different things in your interests. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, as much as you're willing to share um, about your challenges and how you're um, looking to solve them, um, you know, it's been great to see a lot of people chatting with each other. Um, make sure to choose the drop down in the Zoom chat to everyone um, so that uh, people can see your questions, um, or if a lot of people are answering other people's questions, you know, to make sure that they can see your answer, please choose that. Um, if you have something burningly private, of course, you can just message me uh, directly um, or follow up later in email, but we're um, happy to help you here. Uh, okay, so today we'll be talking about GitOps um, via this Flux project that I just mentioned. Um, if you haven't seen our website, Stacy will share all these links with you, um, but the main site is fluxcd.io. Um, if you already like us and you haven't given us a GitHub star before, please do that. Uh, and then um, there's the docs and discussions, and then at the very bottom here, if you haven't joined our Flux channel, which is on the CNCF Slack, um, Stacy again will share links both in the follow-up email uh, and then the chat here um, to get you in there if you have any further questions with us. Um, and then I'll mention this is recorded. We post all of our things on our YouTube channel, so uh, we're happy to share that with you in the follow-up email. Uh, and I mentioned, uh, if you're new to the, new to us, we've got many, many great events uh, in the spring and fall seasons. Uh, thanks to Stacy and our other community managers for putting these great talks together. Uh, we've also got uh, Kingdon on our team, um, who's another developer experience engineer who um, provides support for Flux um, and also does community bug scrubs. Uh, so we will share all these uh, variety of links of uh, bug scrubs, workshops, talks, and all kinds of other topics. And if you have requests for topics, then let us know. Um, we both give talks from our own team as well as have special guests. So we're happy to um, curate among our wide uh, network of friends in the Kubernetes community. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, um, last week Pinky gave a talk on sort of what is GitOps, uh, what is Flux? You know, why would you want GitOps? And um, you know, what are the benefits? So I'll do sort of like a pared down version of that. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Pinky will show you the steps um, to get started in two different ways. Um, so hopefully, if you've come here because you've got several challenges and you're thinking, hmm, I heard of this term GitOps and maybe it might help me. Um, yes, really the benefits are, and many, many um, enterprise companies that are already um, benefiting from this is that um, the way that um, GitOps works provides, you know, great security guarantees, um, as you might guess, even from the term by using Git, um, you know, there's version controlling. And um, if you're using one of the platforms, there's a um, review process. So you have this whole audit trail of, you know, if something went wrong, how did it go wrong? Um, you know, <laughs> who, who is responsible and how you can roll back or do something different, you know, or, or troubleshoot with it. Um, and so because of that, it really helps increase um, developer and uh, operational productivity. Um, so I should remind people that, you know, the benefits of GitOps is that it's both for apps and infrastructure. It's not necessarily for a particular um, team or a particular area. Um, and so many of our users have said, you know, we've used GitOps because, you know, it provides reliability and stability, velocity, all the ETs, 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 um, but they really are truly um, benefiting from it and um, are able to have consistency across their team so that they can fo focus on innovation um, and, you know, automation so that they're minimizing manual um, things or minimizing, you know, the time to getting things back up and started. Um, I think those are the main things. And if you've seen any of our previous talks, and Stacy would be happy to share uh, any of our links from our past GitOps days. Um, we just have so many stories of people saying, you know, there's the DORA research that showed that companies that have high velocity are companies that show other business success metrics like, you know, faster time to IPO or um, higher revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So all these um, 
technical areas and operational areas really do help the business as well. And so I think that's why so many people have become so excited um, about GitOps. Um, and then we are promoting here Flux, the project that we created that, as I mentioned, is in the CNCF, has so many enterprise users. Um, and not only that, has um, the main cloud, provisor, pro cloud providers trusting Flux um, to deliver GitOps to their customers. Um, you know, uh, it, I, don't, I think uh, it was a good show that we went through the security audit process um, quite well. Um, and then, you know, we're pretty lined up to complete the final steps for graduation. And it all shows, you know, why all these companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Red Hat, VMware, D2IQ, and we ourselves um, are able to build our products and um, services on Flux because it is so stable and designed so well. Um, so uh, a reminder here, just as with the benefits and important things about um, GitOps, uh, Flux itself is, is designed for apps and infrastructure. Um, it reduces the developer burden. You know, it really helps with that velocity um, and the sense of reliability that you know you know what went into production and you know that you can fix it if something goes wrong. Um, and it's really important to know that you know people are like, oh, CI/CD. You know, I've put all this investment into our Jenkins setup, um, you don't have to tear up your existing tools. You don't have to tear up your CI. You know, it works with the existing tools that you have. And also it's extensible, like people can build upon it. It has a really great microservices architecture that we'll talk a little bit more later. Um, and more importantly, it is Kubernetes native. Uh, we've talked a lot about how GitOps, the practice, is a natural evolution of Kubernetes. Um, and Flux itself really demonstrates that. Um, and then Flux specifically is designed to really work well with common Kubernetes tooling, primarily Helm and Customize. So, you know, we've not built it as like this kind of floating add-on thing. It's like really designed to work with those. And we have a great story from the Department of Defense sharing how like Flux was just a clear winner because they wanted to make sure they could use the um, Helm ecosystem and Flux could guarantee that. Um, another key thing to know about Flux is, is multi-everything, multi-tenancy, multi-cluster, et cetera. Um, so it can, it's really designed to be able to do all of that. Um, it also has, sets up alerts and notifications, which is really important. And as I mentioned, um, users trust Flux. So that's not only our many enterprise and medium company users who've been using Flux for many years, but also cloud prevent providers like Amazon, um, Microsoft, VMware, et cetera, Red Hat, they, you know, they're all seeing the strength in how Flux is designed. So those are the benefits. Um, so hopefully just, you know, you, you are understanding, you know, that these are solving these challenges that you may have. Uh, but in terms of what is exactly um, GitOps is that it's an operational model that um, works specifically for cloud native um, applications, not necessarily for Kubernetes, um, but you know, we are seeing more and more strength of people sort of benefiting from the way that Kubernetes is designed. Um, and so it's not only for that, but that's definitely where we're seeing a lot of the value. Um, and as I mentioned, because it uses Git, um, you know, there's a version control system, so you always have a single source of truth. So we have our famous story where one engineer made a change and brought down the whole system. But since we had uh, a repo that basically stated what the clusters should look like, um, all the tools like Flux that we had in place were able to go and say, okay, I need to rebuild everything. What is it supposed to look like? And that, you know, all the specs, the configs were there, so we could just build it out from that. And so that's what really like led us to say, wow, this is really a thing. This is a way, way of operating. Um, and so maybe we should create a term for it. Um, importantly, I should mention though, if you are not using Git, you can still do Git ops without Git itself. Um, in fact, I think more and more as we're evolving, you know, all of us in, in the field as well, you know, we're seeing all kinds of different systems that people can use to still get GitOps functionality. So just something to think about, um, you know, right now Flux works with all the Git providers, um, but in the future, as we develop more, there's definitely ways in which you can still apply the methodology without necessarily having Git itself. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, you know, so much of the benefits that you um, would get from GitOps is that it's a system that uh, enables continuous delivery 
that works with your CI system that makes it possible to have you know, automated deployment, monitoring, and you know, managing through your version controlled system. Um, and again, we want to mention, you know, there's some tools that work primarily for apps and other for infrastructure, but um, really across the board, um, GitOps is, is for all of those. And we have so many different um, enterprises that have different teams all um, getting the value out of GitOps. Um, and so GitOps is not just something that we're talking about as a company. Um, thankfully, now it's in the CNCF. There is a working group. Um, and there's this whole site, it's called Open GitOps, where all these principles have been like uh, discussed over and, and um, you know, reviewed um, by many, many companies that have come together as part of this organization. And so there are four core principles um, that really provide this um, value of GitOps. So you have to make sure your system is declarative. As I mentioned, you also have versioning and also it has to be immutable. Um, needs to have a pool based system and reconciliation is a core part of that. Now, if that scares you, don't worry. Um, we have many talks by people who are quite advanced users and they all give the same advice. They say, you know, start with the one that you think is the low hanging fruit. You know, it's a journey. It's not like overnight you have to have all these four principles working and in place. Um, in fact, many of the advanced GitOps users at this point still only have three out of the four, but they're on their path to maximizing their GitOps experience by kind of um, um, reaching these, these principles. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions about this, we can cover this a little bit more. Um, and then finally, um, you know, hopefully you get a sense now of what Flux is, you know, Flux was designed to have all this capability. Um, it's designed to maintain those four principles. Uh, and it, you know, it is a specifically a continuous delivery uh, tool that is built on Kubernetes. It really is part of that evolution of GitOps coming out of Kubernetes. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's this uh, project called Flagger um, that we folded into Flux um, because it provides the progressive delivery, AKA like canary deployments and blue green deployments that you can do. So they work really well together. Um, I should note with Flagger that there are plenty of people who love, love using Flagger um, not together with Flux. And so that is very much possible too. So right now I think we're designing it so you know they're optimized to work together, but Flagger does still support um, other types of uh, tooling that people really love using with Flagger. And it's really been excited to see that project grow. Um, so again, uh, yes, just to review, you know, hopefully you understand generally what the GitOps benefits are, what the four principles are, and how Flux um, provides all of those um, benefits for apps and infrastructure teams, for multi-tenancy and multi-cluster, um, and reaching all of those um, goals and principles of Flux. Um, and I should mention at the very end, uh, we have a lovely community. Um, there's tons of people actively helping each other on Slack and answering each other's questions. Um, and uh, it's really been fun to see it grow. Uh, we're also building out our um, contributor experience so that the people who've been contributing, you know, we really want to thank all the great work that they do, regardless of whether it's docs or um, code or what have you. It's been really great to grow and learn with everybody together. Um, all right, so before we head into the actual getting started parts, I uh, just wanted to emphasize that Flux itself is designed very much in a microservices architecture so that you have all of these different pieces that do different things uh, in the world of Flux, we call them um, Kubernetes controllers. Um, so as you can see, as the names indicate, you know, there's a Helm controller, a customized controller, notification controller. And that way, you know, not only does it make it easier to troubleshoot um, and, you know, make it more extensible, uh, but it also makes it easier for people to contribute if, um, if you're interested in, you know, helping out with any of these controllers. Um, and I lay these out because um, uh, Pinky will be kind of referring to them um, as, as we go through the getting started steps. Um, so now I'll just highlight what we're going to do is we have two ways to get started with Flux. Um, the first one we'll do um, is using um, this project that we have that's called Weave GitOps. It's free and open source. And what it does is like if you are brand new to this and you're like, I don't want to have to make a bunch of decisions in the beginning. I don't want to have decision fatigue. Um, this Weave GitOps, this free and open source project um, helps you 
go through the getting started steps with Flux and it'll set up things like your directory structure. Um, it'll, it'll be very opinionated and how it sets things up. So we think it's, if for some people, it's a great way so that you've got everything up and running. And hopefully over time, you'll start learning like, okay, for my needs, I need to change one thing or another thing, or you know, I might need something different. Um, and then you can kind of grow into it and hopefully give us uh, feedback um, as well as you know, see if like some clusters are perfect for using weave getups and others maybe you want to start experimenting with um, vanilla flux um, and then pinky will go through the second version which is um, how to get bootstrapped with flux um, itself so that um, you know for those of you who maybe kind of know a little bit more of what you want and you won't have as much decision fatigue um, flux uh, the flux setup will show you a little bit more of like the decisions you can have and the control that you could have to customize so um, both don't take very long um, and I think because of Zoom challenges, uh, Pinky uh, has some recordings, and so um, they will be able to walk you through them. And hopefully both uh, paths will be helpful for you to understand, you know, maybe one path is good for one of your teams and another path is good for another one of your teams. So I would love to have your feedback. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Pinky. Yeah, so let me share my screen. So yeah, as Tomo mentioned, uh, I tried to get the demos, the live demos to work with Zoom, but I think Zoom's eating into my um, uh, memory too much. So I, I wasn't able to get it to work, but I did record the demos and I will be talking over them as, as I'm going. But the first one we're gonna be doing, as she mentioned, is Weave GitOps. And this is the getting started guide for Weave GitOps. Um, Stacey, I think either dropped a link or she's going to, um, to, this, uh, to this documentation. And um, the, you'll basically, the things you'll need is a GitHub account, um, you'll need cube control. And if you're using Kind, um, you'll use, then you, you need Docker as well. And then to install the Weave GitOps CLI, there's, there's instructions here. Um, I've already installed it and I've already set up my um, Kind uh, cluster. And um, you'll also need to create a uh, config repo. So I created one called GitOps config. Um, as is recommended, but it's not required. It can be called whatever. And the thing that's important to mention here is that it does need to be initialized. So I initialized it with a readme. Um, you can initialize it with any file, but it does need to be initialized to be able to do a GitOps install with it. And then we'll also be playing around with this pod info deploy repository. So I forked it as well in advance. And so now we will, um, I will play this uh, recording and I'll talk over it. So First thing I ran here is I ran the GitOps install and I pointed it to my config repo, as you can see. And I basically am, um, it, it, what it's going to do is it's going to actually create all of those controllers that Tamao showed in that diagram. And it is also going to create a um, application for the UI as well. So there is a UI that comes along with this, um, with Weave GitOps. And so what these controllers do is the source controller is actually um, responsible for listening for whatever repo it's told to listen to. And it will actually see if there's any changes that are made there. So any new commit shots, and then it will continuously pull in those changes and just create like an artifact with them. It doesn't actually apply them yet. So that's where the customization controller comes in. The customized controller actually does the applying of those manifests that the source controller has. So they both work on a sync interval. So based on the interval that you give, um, every periodically both will be um, running their, their processes. So source pulls it in and then the customized controller applies it. And then there's also the Helm controller, which actually can do Helm deployments as well. So if you are using Helm, um, Helm then you can actually still use Flux and uh, take advantage of that as well. And then the notification controller actually can create alerts. So let's say you have like a deployment um, that, that you want to maintain, like when you want to keep track of when things are being deployed and stuff, you can actually have it alert to like a, a chat system such as Slack or anything that you're using. And it will let you know, it'll create little alerts. And then um, the image controllers are actually going to uh, do image control automation. So basically, if there's image images that are updated, it will it can actually pull it into your Git repository. So as you can see, uh, it was very oh, fairly quickly. Sorry, sorry. Do you mind yeah, if we pause pause your video? <laughs> uh, did I? Oh, 
Oh, no, it's just asking if you could pause it. Yeah. Um, I just had a question that I thought was very timely. So if it's okay. Um, uh, is customized mandatory for Flux? I think that's a great question. That is a good question. So I actually was going to address this later, but I think it's oh. a great spot to address. No, 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 no. It's good to address up front. I wasn't sure when I wanted to address it, but I do want to make sure that there's a note that even though it's called customized controller, it's it's not necessarily the same thing as Kubernetes customize. So what you've already been doing, uh, where basically what Kubernetes customize is, is you can give it, it's a file that you can add um, a customized file where you can tell it like a list of resources. It can do all these uh, nice things for you. You can do overlays and all these things, but that is actually sort of separate from the customized controller. The customized controller is basically doing that itself in the back end. So that's where the name comes from. I know it can be really confusing because they're <laughs> they're like different, but named the same. Um, but yeah, even if you did not have a customization file, what the customized controller does in the back end is actually create one. So you don't actually need to have a customized um, file, but you can have. So if you already have one, it can still work with it. Um, so it's like you can have the best of both worlds, really. If you do use them, you can continue to. But if you don't, you don't have to. So great answer. Thank you so much. And thanks for the okay. question. Yeah. Um, OK, so now uh, what it's doing is it's creating this pull request. So what the um, what we get ups does is it actually creates pull requests. Um, and so this initial pull request is actually um, it's going to have all those files that are there with those um, uh, with all those controllers that are created. So as you can see here, the first thing that we see is this Git repository source. And what this is doing is it's it's telling the source controller to, hey, go listen to this github.com uh, GitOps config URL. And then it's also telling it to run on a 30 second interval. So you can uh, manipulate those the, the, the value of the interval and have it do you know longer or shorter or whatever you want. And so every 30 seconds, it's going to be pulling from the GitOps config. So then the next thing here is this customization. Um, and this is telling the customized controller, like, hey, uh, that source ref that we created earlier, continuously monitor that, but also apply, but only apply on this specific path. So only what's found in this system folder within the repository. So not everything in the repository would be applied by default. And this is running on a minute interval as well. So. And then this one is another customization, but it's specifically telling it to listen to the user path in this case. So there you can basically have endless num number of customizations that point to the same source. And um, I'm gonna pause for a minute. And uh, you, can, you can actually uh, have, even though one repository, you can have multiple customizations that point to different parts of that repository. And that way you can kind of monitor things separately. So. Um, along with that, th so this this is, I think, where I was going to talk about the customization part. This is a customization file. This is what we're used to in Kubernetes seeing as a customization, and it points out the resources. And like I said, you don't need one, but um, in this case, you know, it just says which files we want it to be applied. And then this is actually the, um, the, the rest of that is actually the deployment for the um, UI that I mentioned, and then also all of the custom resource definitions that are required for the Flux controllers, along with all of those Flux controllers as well. So that's the initial pull request that gets created. We're going to merge it. And basically what it's saying is it's going to be, you know, it itself is listening to this repo now. So it's kind of a big loop of it's monitoring itself, which is pretty neat. And so, um, yeah, so now that's pushed. And we can go in here and we can actually do GitOps UI run. And that is actually going to pull up the uh, Weave GitOps UI. And in here, we can actually create app add applications and point it to different repos. So it'll actually basically create us a source and a um, customization on its own in the backend, which is really cool. So it's basically doing all of that for you, all the things you would have to do manually. Um, and so in here, we're going to grab the source repo URL that uh, is that pod info app, uh, app that we were talking about earlier that I forked. Um, we're going to use that as our source repo URL. So this is like the app that you would actually be wanting to deploy. And then we're going to have to authorize GitHub access. And that is actually because, and I'm going to pause again, that is actually because of the um, deploy key that needs to be created if it's private and um, also if it um, needs to have rights to push back to it. And then um, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that in order to run that uh, GitOps install command, I actually had already um, 
exported my GitHub, uh, GitHub token. And so if you didn't do that, it would have actually prompted you as well in the, um, the CLI. So that's just something to, um, I was trying to hit the, and that's just something to mention. Um, and so that is in there. And then we're going to grab this GitOps config URL. And that is our config repo URL. So that's the config repo we've already stood up and we did the um, GitOps install into. And so then here, um, I want to mention that you can actually customize the path that you want it to listen to. So what um, was seen earlier with that customization path, you can actually add that. You could change the branch. And then there's this auto merge button. And if you check it, it will actually push it in directly. But I'm, I'm going to, for the sake of this demo, I, I, I chose to um, make it create a pull request. Um, and so we actually are not going to check that button. So it'll actually open a pull request with those changes now for, so including that new source that's created, the new customization, and you'll see. So we're gonna open that and then we'll see in here. Um, yep. So the first thing that's created is actually the application. And basically the application is just a, um, it's a, a custom resource with details basically about the deployment. And then the customization, it, it's, uh, it's referencing the source that's um, created, I think, right? I already scrolled past it. I might've already scrolled past it. Or I froze. No, it's right there. Okay, so that's the source down there. Um, and so that source is actually the, um, it's pointing to the Git repository that uh, is that pod info deploy repository down here. And then that customization up, up at the top is actually going to tell it to apply. And I believe that that one is 30 seconds and then this one is uh, a minute. Yeah, so the customization still happens on a minute interval as well here. So yeah, that's what that's applying. And then, oh, and then the lastly, it also adds a customization.yaml. And this is a customization from the Kubernetes customization. And it's just adding and telling it to go look for this resource as well. So it's telling it to go apply that resource. So that's what that does. And then once we actually merge this in, within a minute, uh, 30 seconds, maybe plus a minute if you're, if you're at the very tail end, then it will actually uh, apply these, these changes. So if we go back, um, we can actually see if we, yeah, so if we monitor, the, so that actually, that deployment is in a test repository uh, namespace. So if we go to this test namespace, we can actually see that it is spinning up those new, um, those new pods. So it's spinning up the front end and back end, which are both defined in that pod info application. And so, uh, yeah, so it, it did that by itself. It actually will sync. Um, in the UI, there's also, so if we go, uh, once this is stood up, if we go back to the UI, then if we go to applications, we can actually see um, a very, like a well laid out um, layout of the whole uh, deployment. And the cool thing about this is that you actually, it's, it basically is all the things that you would have to do through cube control commands. So you can actually just see all of like your resources without even doing cube control commands. It's just a nice layout. And then, um, like I said at the top, there's a sync button. And then here, so this is actually the source conditions and the automation conditions. So you can actually see that the source that was created is, is good and the um, customization is good too. So you can tell if there's any errors or anything like that. And then down here, there's actually the commit history. So you can see like the latest commits that were actually pulled. So it's just a one-stop shop to see what all is, is happening with this uh, application, which is pretty neat. So then um, we are going to try to, uh, we're gonna actually port forward the application so we can see it running. And so you can see here it is with this bright orange background. Um, and so that is what we expect. And then we're going to actually see um, GitOps reconciliation in action. So basically the, the goal is like, if you make a change to the code, it should obviously pick it up and, and do it. That's the whole thing that Tama O was mentioning in, in um, the continuous deployments. So we're gonna change this um, value in, in here. So this is gonna change the UI color and we're actually going to push this change to GitHub. And so this is pushing it to the source code repo. And um, remember, we, we set up a source to be listening to the source code repo and a customization also. So this should actually be automatically applied within a minute. 
And if you um, watch here in a minute, it, at the most, it should actually spin down those repos, the, the front end and actually spin it back up. And so we'll give it a second. Yep, there it goes. So as you can see, the front end is actually being restood up. And so it's being restood up with those changes. And once it's stood up, we should be able to um, see that the change has been made. This, this was uh, me fumbling around a little bit. Um, and so it, it, it was actually in a weird state where it was actually still setting up the pod. So this was on me. Um, I didn't give it enough time. And so once it actually has been stood up, we will be able to see the um, change realized. We'll give it a second. And this is me showing that like it did actually pull the commit. Um, so what you can see that one minute ago, it did actually pull the commit. So, um, and you can check that the commit shot is correct by, you know, verifying with your GitHub uh, repo. And again, this was me confused. <laughs> I think the cube, uh, the cube control command was actually telling me it was still terminating when I actually on the side pulled it up and it was already stood up. So that's the delay here. And uh, let me see, how long did I, how long did I wait? Okay, so um, yeah, so I redid the port forwarding and then, and then I, what is going on, sorry. Okay, so yeah, so it did change the background. So, um, that did work uh, after it did restand up. And so that's one thing. And then I also want to talk about, let's say you have, you know, configuration drift does happen. So things do get, um, you know, out of hand or like someone, like let's say a bad actor wants to go in and delete your deployment. Um, not to fret, <laughs> not to worry because customization will actually, because it's syncing on that one minute interval, it also does hard syncs. And so it'll just hard apply whatever the um, source controller has pulled, whatever artifacts are there. So the nice thing is even though I did this, um, I did this delete deployment, it actually is going to be, it'll, it'll stand it back up as well. So if we give it a second, I deleted the deployment. So you can see it is terminating the front end and in about in a, in a few seconds it'll actually stand it back up and so the the nice thing is that um you know basically it's it's exactly what Tomo was saying for security reasons there's a lot of benefits that come from this feature so this is one of the great things about it so you can see that it's been stood back up and it in a in another second it'll be ready as well so that's uh all I really wanted to talk about with Weave GitOps. So that's the really neat features there. It is, um, like Tomo said, it's a great way of just getting started if you really only have a little, like a short amount of time. And so, um, yeah, give it a try. It's very cool. Uh, did you, was there a question? Uh, no, there were a few, but Kingdon's been answering okay. them. They're a bit uh, um, long. So I think we're okay with that. But yeah, I just wanted to highlight again, um, you know, thanks to Pinky. We'll be covering, this was the first of two ways to get started with yeah. um, Flux. So some of you were mentioning in the chat, like I'm completely brand new to this. So thanks for coming. And I hope that our kind of overview of what GitOps is, um, what the benefits are, um, were helpful. And that hopefully this path might be kind of the quick way to get you started in you know an opinionated way with Flux. And then the learning never ends so you'll continue to learn and hopefully you know you'll start to see whether this opinionated path is um, suitable for you or if you you know become more opinionated yourself you'll um, start designing things in different ways um, so with that yeah i think we're um, pretty good uh like i said the, the conversations were quite um advanced so yeah. um now we'll show you binky will show you um, how to get started with flux kind of vanilla cncf flux if you feel a little bit more like okay i i've been doing my research i kind of know what i want um but i haven't gotten started with flux yet so yeah um 
Also, he told me not to do this, but hi, Dad. <laughs> so um, I'm going to get started with the Bootstrap. Basically, uh, Bootstrap is the more customizable and um, tailorable experience. It's it's more in-depth, but it's also more unopinionated than we've get up. So you can basically, one of the things is you can actually use both, you know, if certain teams want to use the we've get ops way that's totally fine and then if other people want to do bootstrap that's totally fine as well so um both ways work so um i created another kind cluster this time called flux and um i actually also exported a github token so you do need to export your github token for bootstrap as well and then um one thing i wanted to mention is that the flux cli is so awesome it's really really user friendly and um that's coming from me as a previous user so um i really am a big fan of this cli uh it really helps a user basically get started on their whole journey the nice thing is that at the top you actually find if you run like something like flux bootstrap github uh help you can get this and you can do this with any of the subcommands like flux uh create source anything that you're gonna do and the nice thing is that at the top, it actually tells you um, what Bootstrap is doing. So basically, Bootstrap is actually going to be creating a GitHub resource, a repository, if you don't already have one. And it basically commits back the toolkit component manifest to the main branch. And it also um, creates a, it configures the target cluster to synchronize with the repository. And um, if the toolkit components are already there, it'll actually just upgrade them. So you can actually keep running Bootstrap if even if your cluster is already Bootstrap, which is nice. And so, um, and then the nice thing is it also gives you a list of examples on how to actually run it. So you can just copy it and then just like fill in certain things and then just paste it. And it's 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 just works. So that's what I really like about the CLI. And I just wanted to highlight that first. And so then now we are actually going to run a um, flux bootstrap command. And as you can see, we're going to be putting it, um, we're gonna be creating a repository called flux demo that's, that doesn't already exist. And we're gonna be making it private. And um, because it doesn't already exist, it will actually be creating that repo under my, um, my namespace. So, and then um, as you can see here, it is creating, um, one thing I forgot to mention actually in the previous one is that what it does also is it's creating a deploy key. So it creates this secret and then it actually creates a deploy key within the repository so that it can actually continue, so that the source uh, controller can actually have access to continuously pull. Um, so that's specifically in this case, because it's private, it does require a deploy key. If it was a public repo, you could just connect it with HTTPS, but in this case, it does require a deploy key. So that's very cool. It actually does that for you. And that's why it needs also that GitHub token as well, alongside pushing those files up. So um, you can see here that the controllers are already being stood up. And one thing to note with Bootstrap is that uh, it actually only brings up the, um, the, wait one second, sorry, I'm gonna go back a second. So it actually only brings up the, uh, the source customization notification and helm so it's the main four it doesn't actually come by default with the image controller so if you are taking advantage of the image controllers you can just add them on later but i do want to mention that it doesn't come with them by default okay so as you can see in a second because i went back <laughs> uh yeah so it did create this uh repo flux demo and it did push these um, components up. So the components file has all, it creates the namespace. So by default, the Flux system namespace is the one that's created. It's the one that controls everything. And then in this file is also custom resource definitions, all of the controllers, everything that's needed for the controllers to function basically. So, and they're all stood up within that namespace Flux system. And then um, we also uh, get this uh, sync which actually has that source and customize, uh, customization. And so here you can see that it's pointing back to itself, the repo that was just created, Flux demo, and it's running on a minute interval for the source. And then the customization is actually running um, on 10 minute interval, it's a bit longer, but that's actually customizable as well within that um, CLI command, the bootstrap command. And so this one is specifically listening to the path clusters as well. So. Um, and then we are going to go back and I'll show you 
the uh, some commands to actually see the sources that are stood up. And uh, so the first one is actually, um, it's a cube control command. So you can actually run this cube control, get, get you know, type out the whole thing. And this will give you basically, um, you know, all the sources that were created within, uh, yeah, so all the, the all, all the existing um, uh, sources that the source controller is listening to. And then you can also alternatively use the flux CLI to do the same thing, the get, doing flux get source get dash A. But the difference is that um, here you can see in the, the cube control command, you can actually see the URL that's being listened to. And so if you're if you're not super familiar with what, what URLs are by default you, you created, that's a good command to run to actually see those. So um, next, we're actually going to clone that repo that we created. Um, you're gonna watch me fumble over some of this as well. Um, but uh, basically I'm going to clone the repo that was created. So that flux demo repo. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a file to it, um, a deployment.yaml file under a new uh, folder called default that I'm creating. So default obviously is a namespace that if, you, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it's a namespace that comes with Kubernetes. So it's already created in kind. We don't have to um, create a new namespace for this, but I'm gonna be taking advantage of that. And I'm going to be creating a deployment under that namespace. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to actually uh, uh, push a file called deployment.yaml up there. And that's just a simple front end application. It's just a, yeah, it's very, um, just basically as an example of how you would actually, you know, see the, um, I wanna show how you would actually reconcile changes using the CLI. And so, I fumble over it a bit more, <laughs> maybe skip ahead. Okay, so yeah, I, I did a push, I pushed those changes up. And then if we go back to um, see like these changes, basically we'll see them there. And, and the thing to note is that, you remember how, if you know, remember that I was showing, it says it was, the customization was running on a 10 minute interval. So it's a lot longer, right? And um, so I, even though it's there, I just got lucky and basically it just happened to line up in that 10 minute interval. Normally it wouldn't have been there. Um, so I wasn't expecting to see it there at this point, but if it wasn't there, you can actually run this flux reconcile source get flux system. And all that's doing is just reconciling the source. That's not going to actually apply the changes. That's just going to pull all those source artifacts in and store them. What needs to be done after that is you would do a flux reconcile customization after, but there is a way to actually combine the two commands. You can actually run a flux reconcile customization and give the namespace and then say, or, or the name of the customization and then say dash dash with dash source. And that actually does both. So that will actually reconcile the source first and then reconcile the customization after. So if this hadn't already have been stood up because apparently the timing just worked out really well, um, it would have now applied it with that reconciliation. So that's what that would do. And then um, we can see now that the customization has, um, it's there and you can see that it's not suspended. It's, um, you know, it's, it's all there. So flux get ks dash a will get you a list of all the customizations. And then if by chance, let's say you, some change went in and, and you realize, oh no, I do not want this change to be realized. I like abort mission, you know, uh, I need to stop the customization from actually making changes temporarily. There's actually a command flux suspend customization. And so you can actually suspend the changes. And while it's suspended, it will not realize any changes, um, even though the source controller will be still pulling in commits, the customization controller will not be applying anything. Um, it, it won't be applying anything. So if things were de deleted, it wouldn't be reconciling at all. So uh, as you can see it now, it says suspended is true. And then we can resume it by doing flux resume and that will get it back uh, up and running. And then if we do uh, flux get ks dash a, we'll see that suspended is false. So now it is actually still, pull it will be applying those changes on that interval once again. And um, so, that is really all I wanted to talk about with um, 
the bootstrap controller with bootstrapping. I, but I do want to mention that there is so much more you can do with the Plux CLI. This is really just to get you started. You can actually create sources. You can create customizations using the Flux CLI and you can export them. Um, there's, there's many different things that you can do, but we have a really great documentation out there um, to help you get further in your journey. And like I said, it's very, it's, it's more tailorable. You can kind of, um, you have more control in this way and you can actually tailor your experience basically to your needs. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we had some questions that Kingdon's been working on, but I thought it would be a good one to share. Um, like how are rollbacks handled with Flux for any deployment? Yes, yeah, so um, basically you can actually, because it's through GitHub or whatever Git provider, you have all your commits. And so basically the idea is kind of to fail um, faster, I think is the term. And you can, <laughs> I always say that one wrong. Um, you can basically make sure that you, you know, you just make another change. So that's that's the whole point of having that commit trail is to actually make sure that even the rollback is is audited, right? It's still in, it's shown as a change. So you can just uh, roll back the commit. You can say, revert the commit and it'll create a new commit that goes back to the old one. So that's basically it. It's just whatever the current state is in your Git repository is what's out there. Everybody sharing a fail forward. <laughs> fail forward, is that right? <laughs> fail, fail, I knew it was something. I always get it wrong. <laughs> yes, fail forward, do a rollback commit, submit a PR. Once merged, it'll roll back to the old version. <laughs> I appreciate y'all. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, so I'd say uh, we're pretty much at time. So I. I apologize. I had it planned, but let me reshare. Uh, continue. And uh, it is sorry. So thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Hope you can see my end slide, right? Uh, so I'll just go back here again. Um, as we mentioned, we've got um, many more upcoming events. Hopefully, you will now get the emails for those, um, and you can check out our meetup page if you have any questions. Um, and then, yes, Stacy will be following up with all of these links. Uh, check out our um, website if this is the first time that you've seen Flux. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a project that is you know, validated in the CNCF, uh, and uh, many, many enterprise companies use it. Uh, cloud providers like Microsoft, Amazon, and others use it to provide GitOps to their uh, end users. Uh, and if you have yeah, any questions or um, product requests, we have a very active uh, GitHub discussions page, which also um, makes it easy to search. Uh, and then, of course, there's always our Slack uh, channel where um, we will be there to provide you with any help that you need. So let me just check one more time if there are any last questions, but we really appreciate everybody's um, uh, engagement and lots of questions. So hopefully to clarify, these are two ways to get started with Flux. Um, hopefully the first way for people who are just brand new and don't want a lot of decision fatigue, um, it's free and open source it's called Weave GitOps. And um, Stacy will share that with you and it'll kind of get you started with Flux right away and kind of automate a certain setup in an opinionated way. Um, but if you're a little bit more advanced and you think you know what you want, then hopefully the second version with Flux uh, is helpful for you. So uh, we love feedback. So please uh, let us know. Uh, you can just respond to the email or let us know in the Slack channel and uh, we're happy to help.